Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar on hydrocephalus, the latest options for treatment. My name is Dr. David Sandberg. I'm the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery here at the University of Texas Houston and Children's Memorial Hospital and the Mishra Neuroscience Institute. We run a very innovative program for children with hydrocephalus offering the latest treatments and this is a, a public service in terms of educating the public about the newest available treatments for this disease condition. Forgive me, we're moving to our next slide here. So hydrocephalus, as many of you know, because many of you are, are, are practicing pediatricians or parents of children with this condition, is a problem in which the fluid spaces of the brain become enlarged. Usually they become enlarged because a problem, of a problem with absorption of the fluid. There's a blockage in the normal pathway of the fluid that the brain normally produces. This fluid is called cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, and, and the CSF is produced in the ventricles of the brain. The arrow here points to the lateral ventricle, and you can see this fluffy stuff on top of the ventricle, and that is the choroid plexus, which produces much of the fluid, and the fluid goes from the lateral ventricles, where I'm pointing with the arrow, down a channel called the foramen Monroe into the third ventricle, through another channel called the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, and then it circulates around the brain and spinal cord. And anywhere along that pathway, there can be a blockage which prevents fluid from being reabsorbed. The fluid keeps getting produced, and so as a result, you can get increased pressure in the brain, and that is what causes hydrocephalus. So clinical features depend upon the age of the patient. In infants, they'll present with a very full fontanelle. The fontanelle is the soft spot on the top of the head. So in this infant, the fontanelle would be present right around here. They present with splayed sutures. The bones, the frontal and parietal bone, are splayed apart because of pressure. Their head circumference, all of you in the pediatrician's office have your child's head circumference measured, and they plot it along a curve. When the head circumference stays along the same percentile, we're happy. When it starts crossing percentile lines, meaning it used to be 25th percentile, then it becomes 50th, then 90th, then over the 95th, we worry about conditions of increased pressure in the brain, most commonly in children, hydrocephalus. Sunsetting eyes are when the pressure in the brain forces the eyes downward. Apnea is when babies can actually stop breathing, or bradycardia is when they have a slow heart rate as a result of significant pressure in the brain. Older children and adults will talk to you and tell you that they, have, that they have headaches and vomiting, or they can present with lethargy and mental status changes. So once we have a clinical suspicion, imaging studies are used to make the diagnosis. In infants, the initial screening study of choice is a head ultrasound. An ultrasound is painless, it has no radiation exposure, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's fast. And because there's a bone window at the fontanelle where bone is missing, ultrasound doesn't work very well through bone, but in infants you can use the fontanelle, it's the ideal study to get very nice screening imaging studies of the ventricles. CT scan we typically use for emergencies. Now, at many institutions around the country, if your patient who has a shunt, your child, shows up with a potential shunt problem, they will immediately get a CT scan and a shunt series. What you should know is that we try to avoid CT scans these days. A CT scan has the equivalent of between 30 and 100 chest x-rays worth of radiation exposure. There is a risk of, of malignancy with repeated radiation, and we've seen children who've come from other centers who have had literally hundreds of CT scans over the course of their childhood with cumulative radiation risk. So at our center, if your child shows up with a problem, you're much more likely to get a quick brain MRI scan or fast brain MRI. Here's an example, and this is a sequence which takes only two minutes, does not require sedation. It's done as quickly as a CT scan, and 
there's absolutely no radiation exposure with an MRI scan, and we get a very nice view of the ventricles of the brain. We can see a shunt catheter, etc. So my favorite way to treat hydrocephalus is to remove an obstructing mass which is causing the hydrocephalus, such as in this child who was a one-year-old who presented very sick with vomiting and lethargy and had this huge mass, a brain tumor, which I'll show you with our arrow here, which was present in the back of the brain. You can see it on an axial view here. And that was causing hydrocephalus. The fluid spaces of the brain were enlarged. And so we took the patient to the operating room, and we removed the tumor. And then the fluid spaces got smaller. The fluid circulated on its own. And we didn't have to do anything else for the hydrocephalus. The most common treatment worldwide for hydrocephalus is called a shunt, or most commonly a ventriculoperitoneal shunt. And shunts have three components. There's a proximal system, which consists of a catheter, which goes into the ventricle. There's a valve or a regulatory mechanism. So that catheter that goes into the ventricle basically treats a plumbing problem. It drains fluid, which is blocked in the brain, through a valve, which regulates how much fluid there is. And then there's a distal system, which most commonly is the peritoneum, hence the term ventriculoperitoneal shunt. If the peritoneum is not a good location for that individual patient, then we can put the catheter in the heart. This is a ventricular atrial shunt in the pleural space. You can even put them in the gallbladder. We can always find a place to put a shunt if we have to, but the peritoneum is always our first choice. Here's a picture of a shunt. There are many different types of shunt systems, but here's a, the, the ventricular catheter. This is a reservoir that's attached to a valve, and here's the tubing, which would be tunneled underneath the skin and go into the abdomen. So the good news about shunts is that shunts work very well. It's a life-saving procedure, and many children with shunts can have a normal life, can go to college, can do beautifully. The bad news is that there are lots of problems with shunts, and what I tell parents is that they might work one day and fail unexpectedly the next day, a week later, a month later, a year later, 10 years later, or never. But it's like your car or your air conditioner or any other device that's made by human beings that we depend upon. They're not perfect, and they can fail. So there's a 30 to 45% failure rate within the first year, meaning if you place a shunt in a child, that child has a 30 to 45% chance of needing an additional surgery within a year. There's a 4 to 5% failure rate every year thereafter for the rest of the child's life. So the majority of children, when a shunt is placed, will need shunt revisions. And shunt revision, not shunt placement, is the most common surgical procedure performed by the pediatric neurosurgeon. Here are a few complications with shunt tubing that's eroded through the skin in a baby who has a very, very uh, fragile skin. Here's a disconnection of shunt tubing on an x-ray in the neck. So as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I keep two true statements in my pocket. And both of them, while contradictory, are, are very true. The first by Howard Kate, who's a prominent pediatric neurosurgeon, back in 1999, he said, the development of the valve-regulated shunt has led to the saving of more lives and the protection of function for more patient years than any other procedure done by neurosurgeons. And I think that's true. You know, we do a lot of sexier procedures. We remove brain tumors and, our, and malformations of the brain, vascular malformations, aneurysms, epilepsy surgery. There's a lot of things that we offer. And a shunt is a relatively straightforward, easy procedure. But in terms of saving lives and saving function, the shunt has been an extraordinary tool. The second contradictory true statement, which I keep in my pocket, is still true today, even though it was stated by Thomas Morley, an English neurosurgeon in 1976. Everybody hates shunts. They become blocked and infected. They wander. They ulcerate. They perforate. They must be taken out, put in again, replaced, or removed. And many of you who are parents with children of hydrocephalus know exactly what I'm talking about. And so we've got to do better. And that leads me to the topic of neuroendoscopy. So the best way to avoid shunt problems is to not put in a shunt in the first place. And neuroendoscopy allows us to, to offer physiologic solutions to families. Physiologic meaning it's not an artificial system that we're placing inside a child's brain. It's basically manipulating the nervous system so that the fluid circulates normally on its own. And I'll show many examples. 
Here's an example of a baby who had an endoscopic procedure. Here's the typical incision from here to here. It's hidden by hair. It's relatively small, only a few centimeters long. This is a picture of an endoscope, which is just a little camera that has a working port that we can insert into the ventricle of the brain and navigate through the ventricles. We look through a video monitor, as you can see on the screen, and we can do instruments to perform our techniques as needed. So this is a minimally invasive way of treating hydrocephalus, and I will give examples. So the most common endoscopic procedure performed by uh, neurosurgeons for hydrocephalus is the endoscopic third ventriculosity. And this procedure has really, in the last 15 years or so, revolutionized how we think about particularly obstructive hydrocephalus. So obstructive hydrocephalus, here's an example back to our diagram. The lateral ventricles are enlarged, the third ventricle is enlarged because there's a mass that's blocking the channel between the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. So you can imagine the fluid keeps getting produced, but it can't bypass this blockage. And so pressure builds up in the brain, and the child becomes sick. So here are some intraoperative pictures of a third ventriculostomy, which basically what you'll see, and I'll show you a video as well, is we go in with our endoscope into the lateral ventricle, which is this fluid space. We navigate into the third ventricle, and we make a hole in this very thin membrane called the floor of the third ventricle, to bypass this blockage. And so now we'll move on to our video of the procedure. So here we are, we're in the lateral ventricle and we're navigating. Here's the choroid plexus which produces the fluid. And now we're gently navigating into the third ventricle and we're making a little hole in the floor of the third ventricle we use a series of blunt instruments, and we make a small hole first, and then we can use different instruments. Here's the little small hole that we've made. Now we're widening it with a little alligator forceps. And you can see, you'll start to see the pulsation. Here's a balloon that we're going to use to blow it up, but you already see the pulsation of the floor of the third ventricle with every heartbeat fluid every time the heart beats is being forced through that hole and we're making this hole bigger so that that hole doesn't close up doesn't excuse me does not clo close up or scar over with time so we deflate our balloon and you see that bounding pulsation of the floor of the third ventricle we drive our endoscope through you'll see the basilar artery which is a major artery in the brain and its perforating blood vessels we're careful not to injure those structures and that's the procedure and this procedure takes approximately 15 minutes from skin to skin and has a very low complication rate. So here's an example of a seven-year-old boy who presented with headaches, nausea, and vomiting. And what you can see is that his fluid spaces, the lateral ventricles, are enlarged. This is an MRI scan, and you can see this sort of white signal outside the ventricles. That's called transependymal absorption of CSF. What that means is that the pressure in this child's brain is so high that fluid is forced into the brain tissue itself. And the reason he has this pressure is that he's got a relative narrowing of the cerebral aqueduct. There's a blockage in the same place I showed you where there was a lesion. So we performed that same procedure I just showed you by video, an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And here's the result three months later. His ventricles are much smaller. The fluid is being forced through that hole. You can see it on this sagittal T2 weighted MRI scan. And most importantly, the child feels better. He's back to school, doing well, no headaches or vomiting, etc. Here's another example of a nine-year-old boy who presented with similar symptoms, symptoms that are associated with increased pressure in the brain. He had headaches, vomiting, he had visual changes, he had massive, massive hydrocephalus caused by a tumor that we know on imaging is a benign tumor. This is not a cancer. This is not going to threaten this child's life, but it is making him very sick and is life-threatening because of the hydrocephalus. We don't need to biopsy this tumor. We know what it is. It tends to stay stable over years and years, but we do need to treat the hydrocephalus. And the ideal way to do so is with the third ventriculostomy. We did so. Here's his post-operative MRI scan. You can see the brain is under much less pressure. Here, you don't really see the folds in the brain called gyri as well. The sulci, which are the spaces in the brain, are sort of tight. You can see they're nice and large here. They're normal. He's doing well, most importantly, clinically. He's a straight-A student. This procedure was done seven years ago, and he's doing beautifully since then with no additional surgeries needed. One of my favorite things to do as a pediatric neurosurgeon 
is to take that difficult shunt patient, that patient who's been back and forth to the pediatric neurosurgeon's office, to the emergency room with shunt malfunction after shunt malfunction, and render them shunt independent. Here's an example of a 15-year-old who's back with his usual symptoms. He's had a number of shunt revisions. I don't remember how many. He presents with headache and vomiting. His ventricles are enlarged. His shunt catheter is within the ventricle, but it's not draining. It's blocked or, or it's not working for a variety of possible reasons. Here, his films preoperatively. So I could have done what many neurosurgeons would do, which is say, okay, he's got a shunt malfunction. I'm going to fix his shunt. And sure enough, he would feel better that same day of surgery and likely go home the next day. But he might be back the next day or the next week or soon thereafter with yet another problem. So what I did instead was two things. I did an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is the treatment we talked about. And I also did what's called an endoscopic septostomy, which is you can see that his lateral ventricles do not communicate with one another. One side is larger than the other. So we make a hole in the septum pellucidum, which is the membrane between the lateral ventricles, so that the fluid spaces communicate. This is six weeks postoperatively. He's feeling better. His ventricles are smaller, and he hasn't required a shunt revision since, even though we know that his shunt is not working. Some of our patients are very complicated. This is a patient who had a shunt that was placed, and it's working very well on the right side, right? The right and left are switched on CT scans. So unfortunately, on the left side, his ventricle has enlarged considerably, and it's a baby who's symptomatic. The fontanelle, that soft spot I mentioned, is very full. So what can I do? Well, I, could, I know this shunt is working. I could put a second shunt on the other side, and that's what many neurosurgeons would do. And you know, in previous times, there were patients who had two, three, four, five, even six shunts in different places, which would be a nightmare for the families, a nightmare for the neurosurgeons to manage when they come in with problems, because it's hard to know which one is the problem. But instead, we just do a septostomy. Here's an intraoperative picture from the endoscope of a hole we made in the membrane communicating these ventricles. Here's after that fenestration or opening. You can see the little opening we made. This ventricle is a little larger. This ventric ventricle is a little smaller. Overall, though, the brain looks healthier. There's a little fluid around the brain indicating that the brain is not under pressure, and the patient did very well, and we spared the patient from having a second shunt. We sometimes use neuroendoscopy to treat patients who have hydrocephalus as a result of cysts in the brain, most commonly arachnoid cysts. So an arachnoid cyst is just a fluid-filled space and it's surrounded by a membrane. And those membranes, if they occur within the lateral ventricles, can block the circulation of that cerebrospinal fluid. So the arrow here points to this huge cyst that's in the supracellar region above the cella tersica, where the pituitary gland sits. And it's blocking the fluid circulation in the brain because it's basically filling the whole ventricle. This was a seven-month-old girl who presented with a head that was growing and crossing percentile lines, as I mentioned previously. So here's the intraoperative view. Here's the lateral ventricle, and you see this membrane with little fine blood vessels in it, which is completely blocking the foramen of Monroe, the opening between the lateral ventricle into the third ventricle. So we coagulate, we, make, uh, we basically burn that membrane, which has no function. We open it up, and we make a hole in a bottom membrane. And here we're looking at that same basilar artery at the bottom of the third ventricle once we've communicated all the fluid spaces. We don't leave a shunt. We don't leave any hardware. And here's one year after surgery. The ventricles are smaller. You can see the brain looks healthier. There's no more of this transependable absorption of CSF. This jet of black is fluid being forced through our third ventriculostomy hole. And here's two years later. The ventricles are still larger. This child is now five years old and is a normal child attending kindergarten doing beautifully. Sometimes, and now we're getting into more complicated things, sometimes we not only treat hydrocephalus with the endoscope, but we can treat brain tumors as well, which can occur simultaneously. Here's an example of a 15-year-old boy who presented with the typical symptoms of hydrocephalus. The patient had hydrocephalus caused by this tumor, which is in the pineal region. Now, I love doing surgery to remove tumors in the pineal region. It's in the center of the brain. They're challenging surgeries. They're very interesting. There are a number of different approaches. They tend to be large surgeries, which are a big operation for the child. They take four to six hours or even longer sometimes. But this particular tumor looks like a tumor that doesn't need surgery. It's likely what we call a germinoma, which is a tumor which is, can be cured with over a 90% cure rate with chemotherapy and radiation. 
So I have two problems. One is I've got a brain tumor and I need to confirm the diagnosis. The other is this kid is sick from hydrocephalus. So what we did is an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. We make a hole in front of the brain stem, as we said, in the floor of the third ventricle. And we can also, while we're in there with our endoscope, biopsy the tumor, which indeed turned out to be a germinoma. And we treated the child with radiation and chemotherapy. The tumor melted away, and the child required no additional treatments for hydrocephalus. <clears throat> Getting into another complicated procedure, this is endoscopic aqueductoplasty. So some of you might be wondering, because some of you might have children with aqueduct or patients with aqueductal stenosis, if you have aqueductal stenosis, which is a narrowing of this channel, why do you do a third ventriculostomy? Why not just open up that channel? And most of the time, we, we do the third ventriculostomy because it's actually a safer procedure. The cerebral aqueduct is surrounded by the brain stem and if you injure that portion of the brainstem, you can have problems with eye movements. The eyes can go in different directions, and children can have double vision. So the endoscopic third ventriculostomy is actually safer. But there are circumstances in which an aqueductoplasty is negative. Aqueductoplasty just means opening up that cerebral aqueduct. And I'll give you an example. So this was a child, we're going to show you a video, who had what's called an isolated fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle did not communicate either with the cerebral aqueduct. We're going to just start this video in one second. The cerebral aqueduct did not communicate either with the third ventricle or the fourth ventricle. So it was blocked in both directions, and the third ventriculostomy was not safe. So we went with, with our endoscope. Here's the foramen where we normally go through. It was a little scarred over. So we're doing a septostomy, which is good because it's going to communicate the two lateral ventricles. So we're making a hole in this membrane between the two lateral ventricles. We can burn that space because it has no function. We blow it up with our balloon. And there's the hole that we made. Now we're entering the other lateral ventricle. This child had some previous bleeding in the brain from prematurity. There are little spots on the brain you can see. Here's the wide open foramen of Monroe on the, on the other side, on the left side. And we can enter that space and get to the third ventricle. And in the back of the third ventricle, you'll see there's a little tiny opening, which you're about to see, which we're going to make bigger this little area right here, and there's a little membrane occluding it. That's the cerebral aqueduct. So we take our little balloon, and hopefully you'll see this on your screens. There's a little pop as this balloon goes in and comes out, and there it is, a little pop. And you can see there's an opening that we've created, and now we very carefully and very gently, because we don't want to hurt this kid's eye movements, open that balloon partially. We don't open it completely. We want to make it a little bigger, and we can look now into the fourth ventricle of the brain. And now we're going to slide a catheter, a shunt catheter, under direct visualization with the endoscope into that fourth ventricle. This catheter has two sets of holes. One set of holes are going to be in the fourth ventricle, and the other set of holes is going to be in the lateral ventricle. So we're sparing this child two shunts with this relatively complicated procedure and this is the view at the end of the surgery. And we can go on to the next slide. So here are the imaging studies of this child, both before and after surgery. So this child had a reservoir. It was a premature infant. The lateral ventricles were huge. The fourth ventricle was huge. The fourth ventricle was isolated. And so here's that catheter that you just saw us place with the endoscope. It's sitting in the fourth ventricle, which is dramatically smaller. The brainstem was previously pushed forward. Now it's in normal position. The lateral ventricles are smaller. And this child has done beautifully with a follow-up period of 18 months so far. So I'd like to mention endoscopic choroid plexus cauterization, also called endoscopic choroid plexus coagulation. This gentleman here, his name is Ben Worf, is one of my heroes. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon who's currently at Boston Children's Hospital. He went to Africa um, a number of years ago, taking his wife and six children there, and treated thousands and thousands of children with hydrocephalus. And he basically revolutionized the way we do some of these procedures 
by reintroducing something that had been tried before but was now better with more modern equipment, which is choroid plexus cauterization. Basically, not only doing a third ventriculostomy, but burning the choroid plexus, which is the stuff in the brain which makes the fluid. And what he found in a study of a huge study of 550 African children was that children who had third ventriculostomy with choroid plexus cauterization did better than children who had endoscopic third ventriculostomy alone. And so here's a, a video that we're going to show you of choroid plexus cauterization along with third ventriculostomy. And we're doing this in more and more infants to try to prevent them from needing shunts. So we're starting our video. You're now becoming very familiar with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy technique. So you'll see that again in the beginning portion of the video. So here we are. We're making our hole in the floor of the third ventricle. We're blowing up that hole, making it bigger. I know some of you are listing questions. We will answer all those at the end. You can see the basilar artery down here. This is the base of the skull. Nice pulsation through the, through the floor of the third ventricle. So we've done that portion of our procedure. But to maximize its success, now we're going to burn the choroid plexus. So here we're sort of spot welding, burning the choroid plexus, making sure we don't burn the brain. Just the choroid plexus, which has one function, which is to produce fluid. You can't burn all the choroid plexus, so you burn as much as you can. Um, and there's still plenty of fluid that's being produced, so there's never an underproduction of fluid. And here we are gently burning it all along its course. and completing the choroid plexus coagulation. And then we're going to do a septostomy. This is the septum pellucidum. You've seen us do that now as well. Just a membrane that connects the two lateral ventricles, which has no other function. We're going to open up that membrane. And once we do so, this will enable us to burn the choroid plexus on the other side of the brain as well. So we're opening this up. And now we've opened up that septum pellucidum. We're on the other side. Here's the choroid plexus on the other side. And we can start burning that choroid plexus. And we can move on to the next slide. I think you get the idea. But this has increased the success rate when combined with endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And it's not done at every center. A select number of centers around the country are doing this with more and more frequency. As the cases get more complex, with hydrocephalus associated with brain tumors and other pathologies, the endoscope can really help us a lot. Here's a six-year-old child who came to us from Venezuela with two problems. One, the child has hydrocephalus. And the reason for the hydrocephalus is this massive tumor in the brain, which is mostly a cyst, which is called a craniopharyngioma. Um, in Venezuela, they basically did not do anything to treat either of these two conditions effectively. So the child came here seeking care. And I'll show you what we did with our video. So we went in with our endoscope. And we start by burning this membrane of this tumor. And this child's quest was very, this child came to us very symptomatic from the hydrocephalus with headaches and um, learning disabilities and other issues which were probably caused by long-standing ventricular megaly, which is long-standing enlargement of the ventricles. And that was caused by this obstructive tumor, which wasn't properly treated. So we're opening that membrane. We let out some of that cyst fluid. That's this yellowish fluid that you see here. And you see some calcium crystals. And then we can go in. We have this new endoscope, which uh, we're only the second institution in the country to have it, which now allows us to work with two hands. We're lifting up tumor tissue and burning it and then cutting pieces out to try to decompress this tumor. Now, many tumors we can remove endoscopically completely just with an endoscope. So some patients who used to have a big operation would now get a little tiny incision like I showed you. And, um, and a small procedure to even remove a brain tumor. The technology is expanding day by day and is really exciting. This patient, we basically were staging. We had a staged approach. Um, 
first we wanted to treat the hydrocephalus and decompress the cyst. So this is after that endoscopic procedure. With a tiny little incision on the top of the head, we're able to massively decompress the cyst. The ventricles are smaller. And then we have a much smaller target to go in and do a larger surgery to remove it. Here's at the end a removal of the rest of the tumor. The child is doing very well. No new neurological problems. And her headaches have gone away. And she's now six months after surgery and has several clean MRI scans. So coming to the conclusion of the webinar, my concluding thoughts about hydrocephalus are that many of you have children or have patients who have shunts. And sometimes we still have to place a shunt. And shunts are highly effective, but they have many complications. So in my practice, we try to avoid putting shunts in in the first place. And if a patient who comes in, if, if a patient comes in with a shunt problem, we try to find endoscopic solutions to the problem instead of just revising the shunt and then having to come back again and revise the shunt later because the shunt malfunctions tend to occur in clusters, unfortunately. So technological advances in neuroimaging and neuroendoscopy are really expanding treatment options for patients with hydrocephalus. This is really an exciting time as the technology improves year by year. And most importantly, you know, hydrocephalus used to be a death sentence to 60% of patients. And one long-standing natural history study untreated hydrocephalus before the era of shunting resulted in death in 60% of patients. And those who survived, the overwhelming majority, had huge heads and were severely disabled. So we've come a long way. Many patients, either with shunts or with the endoscopic procedures that we can offer today, can have normal lives. They work. They go to school. They have careers. We have um, you know, a student at our institution that we're very proud of who is an MD-PhD student at our program here at University of Texas Houston who has a shunt, has hydrocephalus that she's had since birth, has had three shunt revisions. She's one of the leaders of our hydrocephalus support group that we have for families here. And we're very proud of her. And we're also proud that we can offer solutions like this to patients. Speaking of the hydrocephalus walk, um, this is our team. Um, that uh, walked just this past weekend, actually. Um, this is the second annual hydrocephalus walk in Houston. We, occur, we encourage any of you to join us. This is an annual event which will occur every September. We also have a hydrocephalus support group for families. Every fourth Thursday evening at 6 o'clock, um, you can come and you'll meet parents of other children and also adult patients with hydrocephalus. It's for both children and adults, um, and you can come. We serve dinner. It's free. There's free parking, and there's always a speaker. I've spoken at the event, and I try to come when I can, but there's always uh, speakers. We've had excellent speakers that have been arranged. And you can get to know other families with hydrocephalus and see what they've been through and share your experiences. So um, thank, um, thank you so much for your attention. This concludes the talk, and I'll now move into answering some questions. Okay, so going through the first question, the question is, if a child has a failed endoscopic third ventriculostomy when they are in infancy, three months of age, and are subsequently shunted, could they ever be a candidate for an endoscopic third ventriculostomy when they are older? And the answer is absolutely. So endoscopic third ventriculostomies have a higher failure rate in infants than they do in older children and adults. So in many infants, that's why we these days offer the choroid plexus coagulation. But I have treated children with this exact same situation where they had an ETV, it failed, they got shunted, they had shunt problems, and then they had a repeat ETV, which worked when they were older. So the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Now, of course, we don't want to recommend a surgery unless the surgery is absolutely necessary. And so if your child has a shunt and is doing well, we would leave well enough alone. But when that child comes to the emergency room or comes to the neurosurgeon's office and has a shunt malfunction, if anatomically, on their imaging studies of the brain, endoscopic third ventriculosity looks like a reasonable option, I would absolutely attempt it in this circumstance. So now we're going to answer the next question. Um, is there anything that can lower hydrocephalus risk during pregnancy? So. Hydrocephalus is not a common phenomenon in pregnancy, so it would be unlikely for a new diagnosis of hydrocephalus during pregnancy. For a patient who has hydrocephalus, who is already pregnant, 
there's nothing specifically that can be done to lower the risk of a shunt malfunction or other problem. Obviously, we like to avoid, you know, I typically only treat children, although occasionally I will treat adults who are referred for endoscopy because pediatric neurosurgeons just do more endoscopy than adult neurosurgeons. And we try to avoid operating on pregnant women at all costs for obvious reasons. But if a pregnant woman has a shunt malfunction or another problem with hydrocephalus, they have to be treated. And we just work with our OBGYN colleagues and anesthesiologists to make it as safe as possible. The next question is, what options are there for a child status post meningitis and has communicating hydrocephalus? Great question. So this is exactly actually, so when we talk about endoscopic third ventriculostomy and choroid plexus coagulation, the ideal candidates are those with obstructive hydrocephalus, not communicating hydrocephalus. But this is exactly the population that Dr. Worf treated in Africa. They were mostly children post-infectious with meningitis, severe hydrocephalus, and there was an astonishingly high success rate with choroid plexus coagulation and third ventriculostomy. So in a new patient, a newborn, or a, or a young child with this problem, that would be the treatment that I would offer. And sometimes these children can have what's called loculated hydrocephalus, which is when the fluid spaces of the brain don't communicate with one another. And you can use the endoscope to break up those loculations and communicate the hydrocephalus. Sometimes it works and you can avoid a shunt. In other children, that procedure is not going to be adequate and it's going to fail and require a shunt. Possibly, by doing the endoscopic procedure, we may have rendered the child less likely to have a problem with their shunt, both by decreasing the production of fluid with the choroid plexus coagulation and also by communicating the fluid spaces better. The next question, I was told by my neurosurgeon that the procedure where you go in and put a hole in the third ventricle fails in newborns, so shunt placement is our only option at this point. Is this true? I would strongly disagree. So there is a high failure rate in newborns, but the failure rate is lessened if you offer choroid plexus coagulation with the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And the way I see it is with the endoscopic procedures, the complication rate is so much lower than the shunt placement. What I do is I sit down with families and I tell them, listen, we can go ahead and put a shunt in or we can try this endoscopic procedure. There's perhaps a 50% chance of success, sometimes only a 40% success rate in an infant, depending upon the cause of the hydrocephalus. If it works, it's a home run. Your child has avoided a shunt with all the complications that go along with it. If it doesn't work, then we'll put in a shunt. But the complication rate for shunting is a 30 to 45 percent failure rate within the first year, a 5 to 10 percent risk of infection. And again, we've had kids with multiple shunt problems throughout their childhood. I saw a kid in my fellowship who had had 50 shunt revisions. It's crazy to go through that. And so if we can avoid a shunt, we do so. We go in with our eyes open and the families go in with their eyes open. They know that that procedure might not work. But you know, I've never seen an infection from one of these endoscopic procedures. I've never seen a new neurological problem from one of these endoscopic procedures. The biggest complication is failure requiring a shunt. So if it works, it's a home run. And if it doesn't work, then you can go ahead and put the shunt in. So I strongly disagree with that, with that statement. The next question is, as a neonatal ICU nurse, I see lots of infants with VP shunts placed. What dictates your decision on whether to perform a VP shunt or perform a third ventriculostomy. So most importantly, we know that there are certain factors which make a third ventriculostomy more, most likely to work. Anatomic features such as an obstructive pathology. We know that the age is important. We know that if you've had infection, it's more likely to fail, but you can improve those odds by doing the endoscopic choroid plexus coagulation simultaneously. My bias, having seen shunts for many years and the complications associated with them, and having seen the endoscopic procedures now for many years and the lack of complications associated with them, my bias is to look anatomically at an MRI scan and if a child is a candidate for a third ventriculostomy and choroid plexus coagulation or septostomy or aqueductoplasty or any other endoscopic treatment that I can perform which can, which can at least decrease the possibility of a shunt requirement, I will do so. But I will sit down and I will have a long discussion with the family and they will understand that that procedure might fail. 
So moving on to the next question. Would it be beneficial to get the choroid plexus coagulation after having the ETV? My 11-month-old had an ETV two months ago and wasn't offered cauterization. I mean, look, if your child is doing well, once again, you know, we, we leave well enough alone. If your child fails the ETV, what I would do personally is go back in with the endoscope and see if um, the third ventriculostomy orifice, the hole that was made by the neurosurgeon, is open. If not, I would open it up further. While I, while I was in there with the endoscope, there's no reason to not perform the choroid plexus coagulation, which may increase the, the possibilities of success. So the answer is yes, if your child fails the ETV, rather than putting a shunt in, in my hands, I would personally try an endoscopic exploration again. Next question. When a patient is treated with a shunt or other procedure, what is the process to ensure adequate checkups and follow-up? That's a very important question. Whether you have a shunt placed or an endoscopic procedure, this is a lifelong condition and you need close follow-up. Typically, it depends upon the situation, of course, but typically we will follow patients very closely at first and then eventually it's annually. So for example, let's say a child has an endoscopic procedure and that's performed as a baby. After a few days, they'll be discharged home from the hospital and then they'll see me in the office a week later and I'll measure the head and I'll look at the incision and I'll examine the child and make sure everything is going well. We may order imaging studies at some point. Typically, we would then see the child a month later if he or she is doing well and then maybe three months later and eventually, if everything is going great and the family is very well educated regarding the signs of hydrocephalus, what to look for if whatever procedure we have performed has failed, We'll see them once a year, and there are kids who come in once a year for their annual checkups, and they, they get a MR, quick brain MRI scan sometimes, which has no radiation exposure, and, um, and you know, they lead normal lives, which is really gratifying. Next question. How soon after birth is it recommended to have treatment? It's recommended to have treatment as soon as the diagnosis is made. Hydrocephalus is a condition which damages the brain. So when a baby is born, who has increased pressure in the brain, I want to treat it as soon as possible in order to maximize that child's development. We want to do everything in our power to give that child a fighting chance to have a normal development, to be able to work, to go to school, and have normal lives. I mean, that's what it's all about. That's why we become doctors. That's why we treat children, because we want them to have normal lives. I have children of my own. I know what, it, what goes into raising a child, how much you love your children, and we want them to have treatment right away to maximize their chances of having a normal life. So we've done surgery as soon as a few hours after birth, typically within a day or two after birth, depending upon the severity of the condition, making sure the child is safe, is safe from the standpoint of other medical problems. Next question. Um, this was a follow-up to an earlier question. If a child had choroid plexus cauterization as part of an ETV which failed, can you have the choroid plexus cauterization again? The answer to that question is, I have not been in that circumstance. Typically, um, you know, when you burn the choroid plexus, it doesn't regenerate. There's some that's left, but that is a portion that's not safe to get to within the brain. So that aspect of the procedure is typically not repeated. <laughs> the third ventriculostomy portion can be repeated. And so if your child has failed, it depends on how quickly they fail. If I perform an endoscopic third ventriculostomy and choroid plexus coagulation in an infant, and two weeks later, their head circumference is getting bigger, the fontanelle is full, then I know that that child has failed and it's not adequate for them, and I'll counsel the family and advise that we place a shunt. On the other hand, if you do a choroid plexus cauterization and the third ventriculostomy and it works for a period of time, for a few months at least, it would be reasonable to do an endoscopic exploration to make sure that that third ventriculostomy orifice, that hole that you made, is open, and if not, to reopen it. And of course, I guess if there's any choroid plexus that you found that wasn't adequately, co adequately coagulated, you could coagulate it, but I think that's pretty unlikely in experienced hands. Next question. My daughter has a shunt and it seems to be working well. She is 10 months old and had it placed at seven months. What are the signs of the shunt malfunctioning in an infant? So the most common signs would be irritability, vomiting, lethargy. You know your baby. You know, babies can be irritable, for, you know, at times they can cry, they can be difficult to console, but you, know, you will know if your child is different. 
your child probably still has a fontanelle at 10 months that you can feel, which is the soft spot on top of the head. And the best time to feel that fontanelle is when she is upright and calm. So if she's you know, sitting in a rocking chair or sleeping and her head is upright, it should be very soft. If not, then there's a possibility the shunt is not working. Most of the time, it's fairly obvious. And the babies, even though they can't speak, they will tell you that something is wrong. Next question, what is the age until which cord plexus cauterization is performed? It can be performed at any age. I personally only like to perform it in children who have relatively large ventricles because you have to do some manipulation with the endoscope to get to all the choroid plexus. And if there's small ventricles, it's a little more dangerous. But you, it, it's most commonly performed in infants and young children, but it can be performed in any age group. Next question, do you remove the shunt after cauterization or is it left over? What prevents over shunting if left? So it depends upon the situation. Sometimes when a shunt is malfunctioning and we do an endoscopic procedure, we remove the shunt. Other times we leave it in place, but we only leave it in place if it would require a separate incision to remove the shunt and if we know that that shunt is not working. So if the shunt is not working and you leave it in place, it's still not going to be working and hopefully the endoscopic procedure will be adequate. If that procedure is not adequate, well then we go ahead and revise the shunt as needed. Next question, can an adult who has had two ETVs have a, endoscopic third ventriculostomies have a choroid plexus cauterization? The two endoscopic third ventriculostomies were done 11 years apart. The answer to that question is it would be more unusual to do it in an adult, but it, look, it depends upon the situation. In order to assess that adequately, I would have to review the MRI scans and evaluate the patient but theoretically, it's possible, depending upon the anatomy that is seen on the MRI scans. So I think there are no more questions that um, haven't been answered. I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Thank you very much for your participation, and good afternoon.